It's so good to see all of you. I've been away for far too long. And I am happy to be back. I want to say a word this morning from the book of John. And I'm just going to read the verses again. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's one of the most beautiful assertions in the whole Bible. It says that that God comes to break every yoke and let the oppressed go free. It promises that Following in Christ's footsteps will liberate you from the lies that people tell about who you are and the lies maybe you tell yourself. It suggests that there is some deeper reality beyond what we can see and that reality is where we will find freedom. And yet it's also a tricky statement for our modern ears We live in a a post-truth era, a a many-truths era. We are suspicious of truth when it comes shouted out at us from authority figures. We are equally, equally suspicious of misinformation bubbling up all around us. Is truth universal, objective, obvious, and for everyone? Or is it relative, contextual, dependent on on who you are and where you are. And if this all sounds like a better topic for a philosophy seminar, try going on Facebook for like 10 minutes. Most of our deepest arguments today are not about our opinions, but about what the facts truly are. So we come to these words in the book of John with all of this baggage, and it makes us, I think, a little wary of any big, grandiose truth claims, no matter how fervently we love Jesus. It's important not to skip past the preceding verse. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. Continuing in the word means continuing to follow the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Only then do we become his disciples, his followers. In following him, we become free, and we free others. We don't just believe in this sort of truth, we live this truth. And what's at stake here is the difference between possessing truth in order to gain power and seeking truth in order to gain freedom. Possessing truth is all about drawing a sort of a big circle and saying, in here, this is truth. And everything outside of that, well, that's all lies. Possessing truth insists on total obedience. It does not tolerate doubt. You have to shove your fingers in your ears and make sure you don't hear any alternate ideas. And the ultimate goal is is gaining power over other people. You, You have power because you have the most valuable thing in the universe. You have the truth. And what you say, that's truth. What others read in the newspaper, that's just fake news. I think we all do this in some small way. We are absolutely certain that our partner agreed to do the dishes and their failure to do so represents a horrible, horrible thing. We shake our heads at the ignorance of people with different political views from us or we don't want to share the details of a project at work with a colleague who might take credit. Possessing truth gives us a sense of security, stability. Seeking truth, that, that's another thing altogether. It's drawing a big circle and saying, yeah, well, what's out here might offer some insight into my life. It means we're willing to ask questions and to listen to questions. We're on a journey toward greater understanding. We haven't just already arrived at the destination. So we tolerate doubt and we challenge ideas, especially if they cause suffering to others. All this matters because it's really hard to follow Jesus when you're convinced you already know everything. 
A few verses before this teaching, Jesus stopped the stoning of a woman accused of adultery. He told the men gathered, let whoever is without sin throw the first stone. He asked them not to stop where they were, but to continue seeking truth. And it changed everything. We, we serve others best when we see everyone as a potential source of insight instead of a threat to what we hold on to so tightly. Possessing truth to gain power or seeking truth to gain freedom. We're not the first generation to face this conundrum and, and we won't be the last. As some of you know, Colleen and I just returned from two months on pilgrimage. We started in Italy where we worshiped with Baptists and visited the Vatican, the center of Catholic life. We headed next to Jerusalem and Palestine, visiting and praying at the holiest sites for Muslims and Jews and every variety of Christian. From there, it was on to the country of Georgia, which is mostly Eastern Orthodox, and then to Armenia, where the Armenian Apostolic Church has existed for more than 1,700 years. In Portugal, we visited the site where Catholics believe the Holy Mother Mary appeared to 40,000 people in 1917. All these differences between Protestant and Catholic, between the Latin West and Eastern Orthodoxy, they stem from the same question of possessing or seeking truth. There's this constant pendulum swing in history between people claiming to have a monopoly on truth and other people seeking some sort of reform. This Sunday is Reformation Sunday. It's the day our church remembers where we came from and the founding principles that guide us still today. A little over 500 years ago, a monk named Martin Luther wrote out 95 thoughts on the state of the church, and he nailed them to the door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany. It was the ancient equivalent of writing an angry blog post and writing and posting it on Facebook, and you could say that it instantly went viral. The result was the Protestant Reformation. The Pope at the time was just terribly corrupt, more like a king than a servant, intent on building a massive palace. The church financed these pleasures through the selling of indulgences, which basically meant you got to spend less time in purgatory after you die. You could even purchase uh, an indulgence for a loved one who had already passed on. One of the ways the church got away with this is saying that only it possessed the truth. And because most people could not read and because most copies of the Bible were, were handwritten and copied by scribes and precious and locked up in monasteries, it worked. But then came the Gutenberg printing press and a wave of new ideas sweeping across the continent. Millions of people could read the Bible for themselves and they could start seeking the truth of what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? And the church at the time went as far as burning Bibles in order to stop it. Now, at the, at the very edge of the Reformation, there was this small group of people in England and Amsterdam. They insisted that every follower of Christ had the duty and right to interpret Scripture for themselves in a community of believers, and that every community of faith could actually chart its own course. They didn't think that you should be Catholic or Protestant just because your queen was. And so they said, we need religious liberty for all people, regardless of faith. Reading the Bible really closely, they decided that baptism was for adult believers. And so they were called rebaptizers or Anabaptists. It is from this quirky non-conformist group of rebels that the Baptist church emerged. And even when we get it wrong, even when that pendulum swings back and some Baptist churches insist that we possess the only truth and God can be limited to one set of teachings or doctrines, even when we get it wrong, something of that free spirit lives on in Baptist life. 
And we need to hold on to that spirit. We need to continue seeking after that truth. Because we're all trapped by beliefs that make us less free. Each one of us believes something about ourselves that stops us from being who God wants us to be. Something that makes us think we're smaller, less powerful, less capable than we are. We believe with all of our heart, all of our soul, that we're just not smart enough, or we're too loud, or we're too awkward, or too broken, or just unlovable. And every group in history that has been persecuted or oppressed faced beliefs that said that they were evil or unworthy or, or simply inhuman. And challenging these so-called truths is one of the biggest hurdles to gaining freedom. That's the case for big groups of people, and that's the case for each and every one of us. In the place of all those false truths that hold us back, Jesus offers us a simple one, that you belong to God, that you matter, that God came to earth to be with you, that expansive and inclusive love can triumph over endless cruelty and inconceivable evil, that God would die on a cross so that you can participate in the life of God. The beauty of all this is that when we constantly seek truth, it, it changes how we live. I'll finish with an example. In the earliest days of the church, there was a problem. The church had been meeting people's physical needs. Feeding widows and orphans was at the heart of their purpose, making sure that those without an income or family support had food to eat. But in this diverse, multicultural early church, some of the Greek families felt that they were being left out. The Hebrew families were getting food first. And the apostles could have reacted harshly to the complaints. They could have said, ah, oh, we possess the truth. We know that's not the case. Instead, they listened. And they appointed seven people to make sure that the food was distributed fairly. And if you read scripture, they're all Greek names. All seven of those people were Greeks, not seven Hebrews. They were intent on living out the loving, caring truth of Jesus Christ instead of protecting a narrow community. Those seven people became the first deacons, set aside by the church in Jerusalem to serve tables. Deacons aren't in charge of enforcing the truth of a church. They're in charge of all the little things that go into building a community that can explore truth together as a family. Something as, as practical as giving someone a ride to the doctor, something as spiritual as praying for your family. The word deacon means servant. Servant is an attendant, a waiter, one who runs errands or does menial duties someone concerned with the everyday duties and needs of the people. Deacons are leaders who lead by serving. In this congregation, the deacons are here to serve. They're not in charge of the building or the property. They don't oversee the finances. They aren't a final decision-making body. They lead by caring for the needs of the people. This is the time in the life of our congregation that we acknowledge the ministry of our deacons. Today, four deacons will be rolling off the board and four members will join the deacons in the work of the church. So let us thank, first of all, Sally Charles, Murray Rocker, Philip Thomas, and Marilyn McGahey who are ending their service this year. Amen. Today, we will be ordaining one new deacon, Anna Ferguson. And we will be reaffirming Roger Fagan, Georgia Bedford, and Chuck Warren as returning deacons 